What's up, gentlemen? This is Rising Phoenix Podcast, the podcast about how to rise up after your divorce. I'm your host, Michael Rhodes. Let's get into it. Joining me today is Dr. Alex Korb. Alex, let's just jump right into it. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi, I'm a, a neuroscientist, a coach, and author of The Upward Spiral. Great. Well, uh, the, the reason um, I, I reached out to you is, is because I came across some of your material and I, I became very interested in what you do and, and your knowledge and and in particularly around uh, neuroscience, around the brain and around uh, depression and anxiety. So let's let's jump into that. Let's talk about what is happening. Let's start with depression first. What is happening in the brain when when you are uh, diagnosed as depressed? Yeah, well, we can we can actually combine both depression and anxiety in a way because this was my question when I started grad school getting my PhD I was like well there's there's got to be something right. that you could yeah. like measure about the brain that would tell you like are you depressed or not or you know you just have anxiety or like or even you know which treatment would work because it seemed ridiculous to me that the treatment of these things were just like, I don't know, try this medication and like, right. And, uh, there's a lot of great research showing the brain circuits that are involved in depression, but one of the problems with most of them is that most of them are designed around groups of people. Like you take 20 people with depression and 20 people without depression and then you put them in like very controlled laboratory conditions doing some specific task. And then you can statistically see differences on average in say, you know, this region or that region. And it's easy to look at these like little significant blobs and be like, ah, that's the part of the brain that's broken or wrong or whatever. And people are always asking me like, can you just scan my brain and show me like what's wrong with my brain? Right. And the, the truth is that, you know, after all of this research trying to figure it out, like there's nothing technically wrong with the brain in depression. That doesn't mean that you can just snap out of it. Right. It is based in your neurobiology and the interaction of your neuro, your unique neurobiology with the circumstances of your life, but it's not like there's something broken about your brain or there's something wrong with your brain that you can just scan someone and diagnose them with depression. Mm. Uh, and so that with that being said, uh, it is caused by the activity and reactivity of some key brain circuits. And it's a pattern that a, a dynamic pattern that your brain gets stuck in and it has to do with the way um the thinking and feeling and habit and reward circuits in the brain are communicating with and regulating each other uh and uh it's the the tuning of those circuits which varies from person to person but a specific set of like tuning of all, all of your circuits that's get that gets stuck in this uh, pattern that uh, um, that gets in the way of you know your joy or positive habits or um, regulating stress mm. and so on. Um, right. So this is making my brain hurt already. But um, <laughs> let me see if I can try and break this down in a way that makes sense to me. So depression is and or anxiety are caused by outside influences, right? Is that safe to say? It's not that there's something wrong with your brain per se, it's something outside influencing, but that there could be some, or, or, or is well, there I'm gonna, some, okay, go ahead. I'm going to interrupt because like, th this is one of the things like that is very hard to explain about depression and anxiety. Um, the, where they were defined originally is just as a list of symptoms, right? You have this list of symptoms, you have five out of nine of these symptoms, the low mood and right. um, lack of enjoyment and feelings of worthlessness. Right. And like, okay, you check, you know, sleep problems, you have enough of these problems, check, 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 like, boom, you okay. have them for more than two weeks, you have depression. Yeah. What that means 
in the brain is not always obvious. And we would like, a lot of people would like to be able to draw this clear distinction of like, oh, hey, you have biological depression and you are just depressed because like you have, you know, shitty stuff going on in your life. Right. And the truth is those aren't separable mm. because the things in your life affect the activity and chemistry of these circuits and how they are, um, uh, how they're interacting, but also the ge the genetics that you have and your early childhood experience uh, experiences also shape the tuning of these circuits. And some of those things you have control over, some of those things you don't have control over, uh, but it's all the biology. It's just some of the, some of the biology is is caused by stuff that happened years ago or when, you know, when before you were born. And some of the biology is being influenced by the stuff that's happening in your life right now or the specific habits that you're stuck in or the thought patterns that you're stuck in. Uh, and it's the combination of those things that dictates the tuning of these circuits and they get stuck in, you know, overthinking or self-doubt or feelings of worthlessness or whatever. The reason why I emphasize the fact that there's nothing wrong with your brain is because a lot of times people start with this view of like, I'm broken. Yeah. And the truth is like, no, you're not broken. Uh, but <laughs> there are things you can do to change the activity and chemistry of these circuits. You can't completely change, you know, your brain or who you are, but you don't need to. You just need to start to disrupt this pattern by making small changes in your thoughts and your actions and your interactions and so on. And like sometimes uh, it's really hard to wrap around your head, your head around, well, like, how can, you know, I be stuck in depression or anxiety, like, and there not be something wrong with my brain? Like, obviously, there's, there's, you know, it's a real thing, right? And like, yes, it's a real thing. It's a real condition that you can't just necessarily snap out of. Right. Uh, and the way I like to describe how that can be the case, and yet nothing is wrong with your brain. Uh, I like to use the example of a microphone and a speaker. So if you have a really sensitive microphone and your speaker is turned up a little too loud or the microphone is oriented in just the, uh, the wrong way, then, you know, singing into it at a regular volume can lead to screeching mm. feedback. Yep. And objectively you're like, ah, that's not how it's supposed to work. I don't want, this isn't what I was wanting. Right. And yet there's nothing wrong with the microphone. It's not helpful to think the situation is like, oh, it's a broken microphone. Right, I just right. need to replace the microphone. I can't replace the microphone. It's the only, right. th like, there's yeah. nothing inherently wrong even yeah. with having a sensitive microphone. It's good to have a sensitive microphone. It just means, oh, well, maybe I should turn down the volume mm. of the speaker, or maybe I should just stop shouting into it. And so the problem is a real problem and it arises from the tuning and communication of these circuits. Yeah. It's just, oh, well, this is the microphone I'm born with and it's sensitive. Okay, well, let me just use it in this way or let me make these other changes in my life that will affect it. And that's what I, I think of as the upward spiral is like all these different little knobs that you can turn that affect all these, the, these different brain circuits. Is it safe to say that it's, a, a, a lack of skill in some ways so in other words you get you get hit with as we all do shit comes up in life and you get hit with something and you don't have the skill set because of your childhood because of your upbringing mainly right let's be honest it all kind of starts there and so that prevents you from me being able to have an upward spiral to to because you don't have the tools right yeah and so isn't it just a matter not I say simply, but I don't, I don't mean, right, I don't, no. I don't mean it's simple. I mean, the yeah, answer yeah. I think is simple, but the work is behind it is very, very difficult. Um, yeah. Although, although still, still simple in some ways, right. It's just a matter of learning new ways to deal with these things. Right. And, and it's really hard because the neural pathways 
are are they're 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 from childhood right they're they're burned in there right and it's so really hard to change those isn't that mm -hmm. essentially what we're talking about yeah well so a lot of it is skill set and learning new tools uh some of it is like well you have the tools you're just they're just not automated uh, and so you just need to do them more. Like you, you have the ability to do it. Like a lot of things, um, you under, you can understand how to do something. And if someone's like, Hey, reminded you, Hey, you can do that thing. You're like, Oh, right. Uh, but it takes a lot of conscious, willful effort, which is part of the, the, the thinking part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex. Right. And when you get stressed out or depressed or anxious, that thinking part of the brain gets disrupted and the the habit and you know impulse parts of the brain take over and so uh it's like if someone is an alcoholic they might be able to not drink if they're like oh no remember don't drink right. uh if they can remind themselves but the moment they're distracted or overwhelmed by stress well then they just fall back into old habits and then one of those old habits, by the way, is often self-criticism because they're like, I'm so dumb. Like, I know right. how to do this. How can I not do it? It's like, ah, because you you have the skill to do it. You just haven't practiced it enough in a variety of situations to make it automatic and habitual. Uh, and so some of it is a matter of developing new skills. Some of it is, it, it is um learning how to use the skills we have in a more automatic way and setting our life up yeah. so that it doesn't require so much effort or willpower. And a lot of that, I think, often comes down to just like little shifts in your mindset, which again, are like mental habits. Because right. oftentimes, most people have the tools for a lot of, they have, you know, 80% of the tools. And but they're just, you know, using them in the wrong way, or they're trying too hard to, you know, hammer everything when you realize, like, I, I like to think of it as actual tools, like uh, a hammer is a very helpful tool, yep. but it's not helpful for everything. And even if it's what you use 80% of the time, you, and if it's not working when you're trying to, you know, paint or put up drywall, <laughs> Right. You shouldn't be like, oh, this stupid tool. Like, what am I, like, I throw it away. Like, no, like, oh, I'm so glad I have this tool. It's so helpful right. for so many things. It's just not helpful for this specific moment of this specific thing that I'm trying to achieve. So I'm going to put it back in my tool belt and either know which of my other many tools that I already have right. to use or realize like, ah, I need to develop some new tool, some new skill, what what does science tell me is the best thing to do yeah isn't it uh, a large part of it being mindful enough to know that you're not in your thinking brain like and, and is that really fucking hard to do uh yeah like so mindfulness is a big part of it it's often a key first step of simply being aware right like, <laughs> like I, oh i say this yeah. all the time i don't mean to write yeah i say this all the time it, it you're when you're in these emotional states, you're you're in what fight, flight, freeze, or fawn, right? And so you're not in your thinking brain, right? You're you're right. you're you're in your reactive brain, I think is what you call it. And so you're you're not gonna have the logic and the you're not gonna have those 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 tools. And so it, it right, it's about knowing when you're out of thinking brain and and being so being mindful, like, oh shit, I'm I'm stressed and and uh I, I'm I'm upset or whatever. So how do you how do you catch that? How do you, I, I guess, is that, I mean, for me, I know I, I have learned a lot about um, the, how much the body is affected by the brain. Like, mm -hmm. I, you know, the body keeps the score, right? The, the fuck, yeah. everyone, should, everyone should read it. It's a fucking mandatory. Um, and so I think I, I, I've learned to listen to my body and I, I can feel when I'm stressed. But how do you, what are some other ways or other things or how do you stop yourself from staying in the feeling reactive whatever brain right well so one thing is like mindfulness is a tool but remembering to do it in the first place mm -hmm. is often the hardest part and that yeah. is a habit mm -hmm. and 
one of the reasons why people fail to develop that habit of like, oh, remembering to check in with my emotions or notice like, oh, my heart rate is pounding uh, is because they, they don't practice it or they don't think about practicing it until they're in that situation. Mm. And it's like, um, you know, playing football. If the only time you practice throwing a football was like under the lights on a Friday night, like you'd be bad and you'd be like stressed out and like right. you have 300 pound guys running at you. Like <laughs> you need to practice it in, in low pressure situations where you mm. don't need to practice it. And guess what? When you're trying to throw it through the tire, you're going to be bad at it. But because the consequences are lower, you can just keep practicing and get more practice. And then when it's a high pressure situation, you'll have started to dig those grooves in the brain. You'll started to wire those habits to, to activate. And guess what? When you're in that high pressure situation, you're going to mess up too. Yeah. Yeah. But like, but that's helpful and it's still continuing to wire those habits. And that's why, um, one of the biggest impediments to change is the habit of self criticism mm -hmm. because the, one of the reasons we aren't mindful is that we're like, okay, I'm just, I'm just trying to throw this ball through the, through the tire. And then we miss and we're like, what do I can do anything? But like, what is so right. like, okay, well, I can, I can still, keep practicing I still have you know more time like oh I'm just upset like okay that if that be there's nothing wrong by the way of being upset this is one of the other key aspects of mindfulness a lot of times people think like I'm upset I shouldn't be upset like oh I am upset okay well how can I use that in in some way to focus more great like uh so some of the things are about reframing and understanding nothing wrong with having emotions in fact it's good to have emotions yeah. and some of it is just whatever your emotions are mindfully recognizing like oh this is what i'm feeling and say oh i'm feeling anxious i'm feeling angry i'm feeling frustrated or i'm feeling anxious and frustrated and a little bit excited and nervous uh because we can feel multiple things yes it's just that a lot of times when we first start to practice those like little tidbits of mindful awareness that it automatically triggers our habits of like, why am I anxious? I just read the upward spiral or I just read the body keeps and, and I, I should know these things. I should do that. But like, and then hopefully if you do it, if you're, if you're at least trying to be mindful, you can catch yourself <laughs> after like five minutes of going off on this autopilot habit. And then you're like, all right, I can be mindful. Why wasn't I mindful before? They're so dumb. I was just, like, uh, okay, and then maybe a little time, you can catch yourself after four minutes. Uh, and the goal is not that you will never make mistakes or whatever. It's just to be able to catch yourself a little bit sooner. And then uh, to also set up other habits and practices in your life so that um, it does make it less likely that you'll, you know, make those mistakes and, and need to rely on those mental habits. Yeah. So there's a lot here. Okay. So, whew, um, how do you, let's, let's, well, let me focus on this first. How do you practice? Like what's the equivalent of throwing the football at the tire to your mental health? Like when right. you're not stressed, what are you doing to, to quote unquote practice? Right. So there's, um, lots of different ways uh, one of the most, the simplest ways, or sorry, the most straightforward way to practice mindfulness is with mindful breathing in which the goal, and you could download Headspace or Calm or any of these apps, they like walk you through these things. And the idea of mindfulness is basically you direct your attention to some thing that's like basically neutral, but that it exists right now in the present. And you focus on that and you don't pay attention to the other stuff that's happening around in your life. And as you try to do that, 
I'm just paying attention to my breath. I'm not trying to control my breath. I'm not judging my, I'm just trying to pay attention. But as you do that, you cannot help but be distracted yeah. by the neighbor's kid yelling something or by some frustration or emotion. And when you inevitably get distracted, you just acknowledge, oh, I've, I've been distracted by this feeling or this thought. And, you know, and then you'll probably have this automatic habit of like, oh, so stupid. I should be clearing my mind and whatever. Like, and then all you need to just like, oh, oh, I'm distracted by that thought. And the moment that you acknowledge something as a thought or a feeling that you are having, then it immediately makes you aware of the present moment. Because instead of being sucked into this thought that's like focused on your all the mistakes that you've made in the past and you're focusing on the past or being sucked into all your fears and anxieties about the future, you're like, oh, I'm having this feeling of anxiety about the future. Mm. And that is a thought or feeling that you're having right now at this present moment. Yeah. And in that moment, you have a choice to then, oh, okay, well, I'm going to return my attention back to my breath, because that's what I said I was going to do. Uh, or, you know, to just go on autopilot wherever it's taking you. And that's how you retrain it by trying to do something that's seemingly very simple, just like throwing a football through a tire swing, seemingly very simple. And yet you won't be good at it when you first try. And the goal is to be like, okay, well, let me keep trying. Uh, and to just do that for three minutes or five minutes, uh, you know, even 10 minutes a day when you're not super stressed yeah. will give you a habit to fall back on when you are super stressed or it will help you not go down the downward spiral as much because you'll start to go down, you'll recognize it and it will help. Uh, so that's one of the most straightforward and powerful ways. Mm. It's just that, when you feel a lot of negative emotions, that's often a very difficult thing to do to just sit there and focus on your breath. And so there are kind of easier ways to go about it, which are like actually practice slow breathing, okay. like to slow down your breathing and to try to be mindful while you're doing that. The reason why that differs from just straight mindfulness is that slowing down your breathing pushes your brain and body away from the fight or flight response yeah. and towards the rest and digest response. Mm. So uh, it's really helpful to just breathe in slowly, uh, try and relax, allow the air to come in through your nose for five seconds and pause and then exhale for five seconds and pause. And the goal there is to try to relax mm. your body because it's easier to be mindful yeah. when you are relaxed. And if that's even too much, you can just do stuff like go for a run, yeah. like bike ride, because that also helps to reduce stress. And like when, you're, when your feelings are really big and strong, the hardest thing to do is just sit there and experience them. That it is the most powerful thing to do. That is what like mindfulness is about is to just like, okay, there's these big feelings threatening to crash over me and I'm just supposed to sit there, but that's hard. And so often uh, like the slow breathing helps you sort of ease into it or something like yoga where it's like, it's more of a challenge. It's more uncomfortable. Like it's more stuff to focus on or like just going on a run. Like there's more other, you know, positive stuff or just more stuff going on yeah. so that you're, you're not just totally alone with these like overwhelming thoughts. Yeah. And so uh, that, is that what I think if we shift a little to when you're in a depressive state, uh, uh, is that the foundation where you start to get out of it? The, like, like yoga, breathing, is that some of the foundational things that you would do? And then if, 
so then if that's the case, then what are some of the next steps? What are, what are right. some other things to get you out of that depressive? Yeah. Period? Well, so like with, um, uh, with depression specifically, mindfulness is really powerful, but it's not always the best place to start oh. because it's so easy to slip from like mindfulness to like rumination. And now you're just stuck yes. sitting in your own head forever. And yeah. so the best place to often start is with these actions uh, that whether you do them mindfully or not, but just these actions and activities that we know are helpful for you. So exercise and getting some sunlight and trying to go to sleep around the same time or wake up at the same time and just hang out with your friends, like things, they might be a little difficult, but at least like, uh, you're pretty sure like, well, once I do them, like I'll feel a little bit better and like focus on doing those activities first. And then it makes it a little bit easier to be, uh, to be mindful. And, uh, and that's why I often talk like the, the most important things to start with are just moving your body and doing like, stuff that you enjoy or either stuff that you used to enjoy before you're depressed and just be like, okay, well, like it's better than sitting on a couch yeah. doing nothing. And that's often the first place to start. Then you can start to like, you know, you'll have a little bit more resilience. You'll, your stress won't be quite so overwhelming and it'll be easier to think about, you know, things like mindfulness uh, or to think about, and notice oh, what are the habits that I keep getting stuck in? And like, how could I not just um, try to change that habit, but just notice before I get stuck in it, mm. what's a different habit that I could take? For example, um, well, I just remember when I first started going like grocery shopping for myself in college, mm. I would just like go up and down every aisle. Right. And one time my girlfriend came with me and she was like, what, why are you going down that aisle? Like, there's nothing on there that you need. That's just like cookies right. and, you know, candy. And I was like, oh, I hadn't thought about it. And I realized like, oh, like if I'm, if I don't want to eat too many cookies, well, why am I eating too many cookies? Because there's cookies in my house. Why are there cookies in my house? Because I was walking down the aisle and I saw cookies and I was like, oh, those look good. And then, and like the, once you are the, the hardest place to intervene is when you're like kind of hungry and bored and lonely and the cookies are sitting on your kitchen counter. You're, you're, you could theoretically intervene with your prefrontal cortex and be like, nope, don't, you know, don't do it. Right. But you're already, your temptation is like already activated. Right. And so the, the best way to get out of that is not to try and resist temptation and just be like, I need to be stronger or whatever. It's right. to like think, several steps earlier and like oh how could i avoid that temptation in the first place and so when i'm walking down the supermarket and i'm like oh there's the aisle with the cookies like nope i know where that leads i'm gonna buy them whatever and so uh but that sort of reflective yeah. thought process and understanding like oh you know thinking about how things have affected you before and what what patterns you're stuck in and uh and not just trying as we encourage men to do a lot to just like you need to be stronger and power through it like yeah. well no if you can figure out a better yeah. way earlier on in the process to avoid that overwhelming feeling then awesome and if you can't figure it out okay well that's what's mindfulness for you know yeah. and self-compassion it's okay to feel that feeling and you can be compassionate towards yourself because when you're feeling a feeling and you're like, I don't want to feel this feeling. I shouldn't feel this feeling. Well, guess what? That doesn't make the feeling go away. And, and now you've piled stress and self-criticism on top of that, right. which makes you more emotional, which further shuts down your prefrontal cortex. Uh, and so the, these further steps are often, you know, just making these little like mental shifts and practicing compassion, practicing mindfulness, strategizing about our habits. Um, there's also gratitude, which I'm happy to talk about, but you know, 
Yeah. Uh, well, I, I think, you know, I think Scrooge McDuck said work smarter, not harder. Right. So <laughs> if you can identify and essentially, I think we're talking about triggers, right? Know what, mm-hmm. if you know, if you know, going to that restaurant uh, reminds you of your ex, then don't go to that restaurant. Right. And, and so again, it comes back to, I think being mindful, paying attention to what, what affects you? What, why am I thinking this? What happened? Asking questions. Um, you know, just, just trying to understand yourself rather than staying stuck in the pattern of, I guess, like, woe is me, right? Kind of things. Well, we get stuck in these patterns. And this is one of the, the things that's so important and helpful to understand. You're not stuck in these patterns for no reason. You're not stuck because you're stupid or weak. Like you're stuck in these patterns for good reasons. Um, our brains are wired to want to connect with other people because humans are social animals. We like anytime something doesn't make sense and you're like, why am I stuck this way? Why am I feeling this way? I think it's almost always helpful to put yourself in the perspective of the situation where our brains evolved in like 50,000 years ago, where you're a member of a tribe, you know, wandering the savanna. Cause like if, if, you know, someone, your friend doesn't text you back, now like right. nothing's gonna happen right? right yeah but if you were out in the forest on a hunting expedition and you like looked up and you're like hey guys where are you and like nobody responded to you like that's scary as shit because like yeah. not being a part of your tribe or being cast out or rejected from it that's the same you know mm. badness as like being attacked by a bear and like our brains recognize like we need each other yeah. to survive and thrive. Like we don't have particularly thick skin. Like a cow is wrapped in, you know, leather. Like right. we don't have sharp claws or teeth. Right. Like almost any other animal is like better suited to survival in the wilderness. But we are capable of, of surviving and thriving because we have these big brains yeah. that allow us to think and allow us to connect with each other and work in groups and so that the survival parts of our brains were like ah it's just as important to be connected with people as it is to you know avoid lions yeah. uh and so when you are feeling these feelings of disconnection you can remind yourself like, ah like the consequences are not immediately as dire as like being left out in the, you know the woods by myself uh, you know, and rejected by my tribe, it feels that dire. Oh, I understand why it feels that way. And that's why I think it's so helpful to recognize the neuroscience because like you can't change the nature of having a human brain, yeah. but you can just realize like, oh, I understand why I feel this way. And it makes total sense, which is much better than I shouldn't feel this way. It doesn't make any sense because you, right. again, you still feel that way, but now right. you're like gaslighting yourself and you're criticizing yourself. So yeah, that, that's just one of the, the first things to, to recognize that like these feelings make sense. Yeah. I think it takes the pressure off. Right. I mean, and I, I do this a lot. I talk about more than likely you could trace some of this stuff back to, to your childhood. So, I mean, you're obviously going back way, way farther and, and, and obviously <laughs> right. make, makes much well, more because sense. Well, because some of this well, stuff, Right. Some of this stuff is about this is just how the human brain yeah. works and you are human. Yeah. Then some of the stuff is like, ah, well, how does your specific brain work? Because like, well, your parents always told you to, you know, stop whining and stop crying. And so you were like, oh, I just need to ignore my emotions. And so then you weren't yes. as good at being mindful and then you know society encouraged you further to do that and then you know now you just don't have as many habits of of reaching out to friends when you're struggling you have a habit of isolating yourself when you're struggling and to to acknowledge like oh i can understand why i ended up here like that makes total sense it sucks And it will be difficult to change. And here's the thing. You don't have to change. Hmm. But if you're like, because a lot of people, I have to change. It's such a bad habit. of like, no, you don't have to do shit. Like, but if, like, because a lot of times the things that we quote unquote 
have to do right. and the things that we want to do right. are the same thing. It's just that the more that you focus on how you have to do it, mm. the more it feels like an external pressure and it activates stress and it sucks all the enjoyment out of it. Okay. Like your job. Yeah. If you're like, oh, I have to go to my job every day because if I don't, I'll get fired and then I'll lose my house. And like, yeah. that might be true. Yeah. But if you're like, oh, I like my job because I like my coworkers and I like having money to like pay for rent and like buy stuff and then PlayStations that I like, you know, then it's a choice to go to your job. And a lot of times we get stuck in these unhelpful patterns because uh, we're focusing on it as something that we have to do, yeah. even though, which is true a lot of times. Like, yes, there could be negative consequences if you don't do it. Yeah. It's true. Okay, well, there could also be positive consequences if I do do it. And the more that you focus on that, the more it feels like an opportunity, the more it feels like a choice, yes. the more agency you have in your life. Yes. And there's, by the way, good reasons why we don't just automatically do that. Uh, because your brain, these subconscious, these automatic deeper parts of your brain, like the habit circuitry and the, um, the, the emotion circuitry, they're trying to take the simplest path to keep you safe. Yeah. But your brain didn't evolve for you to be like happy per se. Right. Uh, and so if you, for example, experience heartbreak uh, and you're like, I don't want to ever experience that again, that's the worst feeling in the world, your, your habit circuit and your emotion circuit in the brain is like, it's very quick. And it's not even, you're not even aware of it. It's like, oh, brilliant. I know the simplest way to avoid heartbreak. Just never care about anyone ever again or ever try to date. And it's like, boom, boom, we solved the problem, guys. Like, yeah. And you're not even aware that your brain made that choice for you. Hmm. And then it just like when it starts to feel scary to like, you know, try and reach out or connect with someone, boom, your automatic habit circuit is, okay, great, let's not do it. Yeah. But you're the one who has to suffer the consequences. And if there's some point you're like, ah, but if I just follow that autopilot, then I'll be alone. And I don't want to be alone. I want to feel connected. And then you can strategize. You're like, okay, is there a way that I could figure out how to feel connected with someone deeply connected without any risk at all of heartbreak? If so, do it. Like, right. no, no, that, like if you know the easy right. way, do it. But if you don't, then you're left like, ah, okay, well, I could do this thing that's really important to me. It feels really difficult, but it's really important to me. Or I could take the easy path because I'm just yeah. not up for it today. And it's either one is fine. If you take the easy path, it doesn't mean you're weak. It just means like, I just need more time. That's fine. Yeah. But if at some point you're like, well, but this thing's really important to me. Well, anything of value is going to cost something it's going to cost time or money or emotional effort uh and once you sort of recognize that then it becomes easier like oh i'm not torturing myself for no reason i'm not stressing myself out for no reason i'm doing it because it's the only way to get where i'm trying to go so like okay let me do it yeah oh well, let's let's shift a little bit and talk about uh anxiety it's the same sort of uh, questions, though. Um, I think there's probably some similarities, but how do you get out of anxiety? That's more, I think, of in the moment, like panic attack. Type. That's the anxiety I'm thinking of. How do you yeah, yeah. How do you come out of that? Not general, but in the moment. Uh, right, right, yeah. I mean, the, the only reason I ever resist asking that question is because almost everyone asks, like, no, in the moment. Like, what do I do right, right. now? Right. And like, okay, I can answer that. But like, when you get out of that moment then like sure take care of these other things because yeah absolutely it's like in in if you're in you know driving down the freeway and your brakes stop working right oh, you get do whatever you can to get out of the moment but like once it you're out of the situation like okay take it to a mechanic like right. don't just right. keep so that's the only reason i hesitate to ask oh, it because people are always looking for the reason to sure. like not do the difficult work sure um but when you're sort of in that moment of anxiety uh the the brain 
you know, it's activating these emotional circuits. It's getting in the way of your thoughtful, rational circuits, and it's pushing you into your deepest, most ingrained habits. Mm. So anything you can do to notice, like my brain is pulling me to, you know, want to go punch someone or want to do like, if you can do anything other than the exact thing that your brain is trying to get you to do at that moment, that is a win. Mm. If your brain's like, I just want to drink, like I'm wearing a Guinness shirt right here. Like, I just want to pound five beers or whatever. Like, if you just have that moment of like tiniest sliver of mindfulness to be like, okay, just do literally anything like go for a run. Like, yeah, I mean, yeah. going for a run is sort of easy because it's also helpful for you. Sure. But you don't have to do something that is like helpful for you. Just not actively bad for you. Like yeah, right. go chug some, you know, Coca-Cola or whatever, or like chew gum or like dr- yeah. drink a milkshake or, you know, punch a punching bag or something yeah. like, and anytime you do you change it from that automatic habit, you're starting to rewire and makes it easier to create new habits. Um, other things that help with that in the moment. And so and that's like the concept of distraction. Like anything you can do to distract yourself, right. to do or think about something different for like one minute even, yeah. uh, like that is super helpful because sometimes the emotion dissipates a little after one minute and then, oh, it's easier. Or like even the fact that you delayed it for a little bit, um, just it's like weightlifting, right? Like if you can only do something, you know, three reps and then you're too tired, well, that's better than not trying to lift up the weight at all. You're strengthening those new circuits. Um, But other things that can help with that are um, focusing on the things that you can control. Mm. Cause a lot of times we're like, I, you know, I can't control my feelings or I can't control the situation that I'm in. Like, well, what can you control? Well, I can make a plan or I can punch a punching bag. Like right. punching a punching bag is helpful because a exercise is helpful, but B it's something you can do and focusing on anything you can do reduces stress. One of the things you can do also that's very simple is to slow down you're breathing yeah. just like when we're stressed and anxious, we tense our muscles and we breathe faster because of how the stress response works. And just intentionally like right. slowing down your breathing. I'm, I'm making a sound by the way, yeah. because like when you're really stressed, um, it like making a sound actually slows down the air. Like if I go, like I can excel right. really fast, but if I get, right. shh, like it right. forces you to slow down your exhale, hmm. which is easier than slowing down your inhale. Cause slowing down your inhale is like, oh, I need oxygen. But like, okay. So just, right. and you can try this by the way, when you're um, like another way to practice is like after a hard workout, hmm. like go f- do some sprints and then like, shh, like just try and slow down your breathing to a point where like, okay. Now I can breathe regularly is helpful. Um, And then another piece is like, just like, uh, just another way of distraction is like cold water Mm. on your face. Cold water in your face is it, it's a, it's a physical distraction, but also um, it uh, activates um, these nerves in your face that automatically slow down your heart rate. Um, yeah, cold is. water in your face. Like you, you used to think of, I feel like we think of this as like, oh, that's something they did in like the thirties to like women who are hyperventilating, like <laughs> no cold right. water on your face activates. I believe it's the trigeminal nerve. Um, it's part of something called the mammalian diving reflex, which I think is, um, it's like one of the, you know, things that leads to, you know, whales and dolphins being able to live underwater longer. Like when you plunge your face into cold water, uh, it just has this automatic trigger. Like it's a neural connection to slow down your heart rate. And that doesn't solve everything, right? but it's a little bit easier to then make another positive choice when your heart, you know, isn't beating out of your chest. And that's why 
I like to think of it as the upward spiral. It's not you're trying to solve everything all at once. You just make one little tiny change that causes a change in your brain to like focus on what you can control or get a little exercise or splash cold water on your face. And then it makes it a little bit easier for your prefrontal cortex to intervene and be like, oh, okay, let me just be a little bit more mindful or more compassionate or just call a friend or do something else. And then those changes make further positive changes easier. Oh man. I tell you, Alex, I thank you uh, for, for one, for doing this. I could, I could listen to this stuff all day. It really, uh, it just, it, it, it hits every curiosity and it just, I, I love knowledge. I love knowing, uh, I've never heard yeah. of that, that nerve in the, in the face. That's fucking crazy. Um, yeah, I, I think we could probably go on and on, but unfortunately, <laughs> uh, we both have lives. So I'm going to, I'm going to skip, uh, to the last question. And That's a we'll, fortunate we'll... thing, by the way. That's a yes, good thing we have. Sure. It's, but that, I just like <laughs> sort of joke about that because a lot of times, we're like, well, I have work and I have this, you know, yeah. other thing and my kids or whatever. And it's like, yeah. sometimes it feels like a pressure yeah. because again, we're focusing on like all of the things that could go wrong instead of realizing like, oh, what's the alternative that I didn't have a job that I didn't have people that I care about. So like, yes, sometimes it feels like these are things that you have to do and they are stressed. But when you focus on your appreciation yeah. for them and the positive consequences and your role in choosing them, yeah. then you're like, oh, I'm I'm glad I have all of these things to juggle instead of feeling like, oh my God, I have all these things to juggle. I don't want to drop them. Yeah, I know it really is about gratitude. And that's something we'll have to do this again so we can touch on that. Sure. One. But, yeah. Uh as you know, the last question I ask everybody is what words of wisdom would you impart to a man just beginning his divorce process? Yeah. Um the uh uh I think the first thing is to acknowledge that it's it's very difficult and it's a shitty situation um and so so that when it feels difficult and it feels shitty you can be like yep it's because it is like yeah. because a lot of times we we feel these feelings and we tell ourselves that we shouldn't feel these feelings or that they're the wrong feelings and then we make it worse yeah. uh it would be like, you know, if at work you had a shitty boss and you were like, talk to your coworker, like, oh, isn't that boss shitty? And he's like, what are you talking about? Like, you're, you're the one who's shitty. Like, what? Like, uh, and we inadvertently do that to ourselves. And um, I, I very consciously remember doing this, like at the start of the pandemic, mm. when I was like, trying to you know work from home and take care of my kids and like uh, work out and like do all this stuff and I was just like stressed and overwhelmed uh, and I was like oh right it feels stressful because it is stressful uh, and like there was a I think Obama's chief of staff or something had like a little plaque on his desk that said hard things are hard and I wrote that on a post-it note and I put it next to my computer like hard things are hard it's like yeah so when it feels hard, I can be like, yep, it's hard. And then like, once you validate your own feelings, it makes it much easier to be mindful and it makes much easier to take positive choices because you know what, when you invalidate your own feelings and you're like, no, suck it up. Don't listen to that. Right. You're not whatever. Like right, right. Th what happens is your brain, you know, the emotion circuits and the habit circuits, it's, it's doing stuff automatically. And it's like, fine. Right. If you're not going to listen to me, I'm not going to tell you <laughs> what's going on. And then you're like, why, why can't I feel joy? Or why don't uh, I feel any of these things? It's like, well, because you're not listening and acknowledging the things that your brain is trying to tell you. Uh, and so it's just like, okay, fine. I'm just going to go do my own thing. And you're left wondering why, you know, you don't feel joy or motivation or you're procrastinating and everything or, um, and so on. So that's why understanding your brain and listening to your brain is so helpful. Indeed. And again, I, I could do this all day. Uh, thanks so much for doing it. Uh, how can you find you uh, in, in your book and all that kind of stuff? You have a website, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Um, alexcorbphd.com. Uh, I, I have a Facebook uh, page. I mean, you can find me on Instagram or Facebook too at Alex Score PhD. Uh, I created a group 
um, not for specifically for divorced people, but more broadly mm. about um, people who want to use positive neuroscience to stop stress and self-doubt. And so I have a, a private group you can join and the upward spiral. Uh, uh, I mean, you can find more about me or join my mailing list at alexcorpphd.com. Um, but the upward spiral is available um, on Amazon, anywhere, you know, uh, it's in 12 different languages, uh, wow, Chinese, awesome. uh, uh, Romanian, Hungarian, wow. uh, German. So, you know, that's it, pretty awesome. you should be able to find it. If you come over to my house, I have a few <laughs> copies. <too. laughs> uh, well, I accept your invitation. Uh, I'll be over as soon as I can. Uh, I want to, I want a signed copy though. <laughs> yeah. Um, and there's a, there's a workbook too that okay. helps you more specifically. How do I go through these things? And, um, and even a card deck. That's like oh, nice. a little 52 little things that sort of do this first. And, you know, and then if you do that, that helps and like go to this thing that's sort of, it's about understanding and then taking action. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Alex. I really appreciate it. Uh, we will definitely do it again. And, uh, uh, you know, I just, uh, I'm, I'm amazed at the, the knowledge and, and how helpful and useful it could be. So, so thanks for imparting us uh, with that today. I appreciate You're it. You're welcome. Thanks for reaching out. And it's great. It was great to be here. Yeah, thank you. Take care. Thank you so much for watching and or listening. Thank you to Nick Coyle and Lifer for allowing me to use their song, Born Again, which you're hearing now and at the intro to the podcast. Thank you to Justin Dillahanty and all of my brothers at The Alpha Code. Please visit the website, risingphoenixpodcast.com to connect with me and other like-minded men who are looking to thrive and grow after their divorce. And remember to surround yourself with people who add value to your life who challenge you to be greater than you were yesterday, who sprinkle magic into your existence like you do to theirs. Life is not meant to be done alone. Find your tribe. Take care.